And I want to formally welcome you to Introduction to SparkView. Over the next hour, I hope to show you uh, three activities that will introduce you to the fundamentals of collecting data in SparkView uh, with PASCO sensors and uh, visualizing that data in SparkView software and doing data analysis like from this temperature sensor that we will use shortly. So uh, the agenda is three activities. In the first activity, we're going to try to answer a uh, real world question here about how to cool off coffee that you might purchase on the way to school. Um, we'll be learning the fundamentals of SparkView, connecting sensors, collecting data, visualizing that data, and doing some uh, fundamental analysis on that data. Um, then we're gonna jump over to a, a slightly more advanced topic where we're gonna take control over measurements from sensors in the form of investigating a cart that's colliding with a barrier and an, in a collision that happens in a very short span of time. So we'll see what we might wanna do if we're doing an experiment that requires very slow sampling, or as in this case, very fast sampling of data from the sensors. Uh, finally, we will wrap it up with the third activity where we'll investigate and try to discover the relationship between the gas pressure and volume of a confined gas and we're going to build our own labs, taking more control over the visualizations of data. And we're also going to learn a different technique that allows us to associate sensor data with real world data that we read off of instruments and type in ourselves in a technique called manual sampling. Um, throughout, we'll be answering your questions in the Q&A, and we'll stop between these activities with interludes to answer those questions as a group, uh, discuss things like saving computer uh, platforms supported by SparkView, sensors, and topics like that. So uh, we're going to jump directly into the first activity, coffee cooling. And let me pose a scenario for you. Um, if you are a fan of coffee, uh, especially in the morning on the way to school, um, you may occasionally stop at a coffee shop and get a cup of coffee and then uh, bring it to school where you hope to consume it for your first class starts. Um, and it's often the case that that coffee you get at the store is extremely hot. Uh, might be too hot to drink. So if you're a fan of cream in your coffee, there are two scenarios here where you could consider how to get that coffee cool enough that you can drink it when you get to school if it's too hot when you acquire it from the coffee shop. So let me pose those two scenarios. One of them is that you get the hot coffee at the coffee shop and you immediately add some room temperature cream to it and you have a coffee cream mix there and you uh, walk or drive say a few minutes to school from that coffee shop and you end up at school with a cup of coffee that hopefully is cooled enough to allow you to drink it. Now that's one way to cool the coffee on the way from the coffee shop to school. Another way, if you enjoy cream in your coffee, is to take the coffee black and get some cream on the side and have the coffee cooling on the way to school without the cream. And then when you get to school right before you drink it, you could add the cream. You'll end up with the same amount of coffee and cream, but the question we're gonna to try to investigate here is, is the coffee cooler in one scenario than the other? Scenario A, you're adding the cream at school, then commuting, and scenario B, you're adding the or adding cream at the coffee shop rather, and then commuting to school. And in scenario B, or commuting with the black coffee and adding the room temperature cream at school. So I'd like to ask uh, those of you who are with us live to make a prediction. This may be informed or just speculation, but which scenario do you think is going to cause the coffee to cool the most and make it cool enough to drink when you get to school? Adding the cream at the coffee shop on the left, or two, adding the cream at school. So let me open up a poll here and ask you to make a prediction. These are anonymous, don't worry. So here's the poll. Which approach do you think will cool the coffee faster? Adding the cream immediately at the coffee shop or waiting and adding the cream at school? So I'll give you about 15 seconds there to respond and then we'll share the responses. And of course, in this first investigation, we're going to try to replicate this situation, learning about SparkView and sensors to try to answer this question. Great, uh, we have great participation already. Let me go ahead and leave the poll open for about five more seconds. And there we go. I'll end the poll and share the results. So we can see that about a third of you are suggesting that we add the cream immediately at the coffee shop, the scenario on the left, and two thirds of you suggest waiting and adding the cream at school. All right, fantastic. Thank you for your predictions. We'll of course figure out which one seems to be more successful in this next investigation. So um, let's go ahead and jump over to SparkView. I'm going to launch SparkView. I happen to be on a Windows computer, but everything I'm going to do here applies across platforms. So I'm going to launch SparkView. Um, you can see here in the live video that I have some coffee and I have a fairly large portion of room temperature cream. Now this coffee happens to have cooled down a bit. So before we actually begin to make these measurements, I'm going to freshen it up. And in fact, we're going to buy two cups of coffee here uh, so that we can both add the cream at the coffee shop and add the cream at school and make those measurements simultaneously using two temperature sensors. 
So we need to figure out how can we use this temperature sensor to make measurements in SparkView. Well, when we launch the SparkV application, we get to what's called the welcome screen, and it asks us to choose among six different commonly used paths for using uh, data in SparkView. We're going to choose in the first two activities this common sensor data path. It says this allows you to connect your sensors, choose measurements and displays. That sounds great, and that's often applicable across activities. So I'm going to choose the sensor data path, and it's going to bring us to a screen that's called sensor data configuration. And on the sensor data configuration screen, we can connect our sensors and choose which measurements we'd like to see and how we'd like to see them, beginning, though, with turning on a sensor. I'm using the white wireless sensor line here. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on power to my first wireless temperature sensor. And when I turn on power, I see that its Bluetooth light begins blinking red. That means it is ready to connect. And as soon as it started blinking red on the Bluetooth light, you may have noticed that SparkView detected that there's BASCO sensor in the vicinity and said, here's a sensor. You're welcome to uh, connect to it if you wish. Now I'm going to turn on a couple of other sensors. Uh, Kane, do you mind turning on a sensor uh, a desk away from me? One of the things we need to determine in the real classroom is which sensor is mine. So there are a couple ways to do this. The first is to realize that our programmers were clever and they said, let's put the one with the strongest Bluetooth radio signal at the top of the list. So it's usually the case if your lab uh, stations are spread out enough that the one at the top of the list will be yours. Another way to figure this out is definitively is to look at the sensor itself. And there's a six digit ID printed on the case of the sensor. And you can see that is also presented before the name of each of these sensors in SparkView. So I can see that my sensor is 622-484. So to connect to that sensor, I'm going to click on it, and it is going to make a wireless Bluetooth connection and move up to the top of the list. Now, when it connects a sensor, it presents it in the middle here. This blue line tells me that I have a white, I have a wireless temperature sensor, and the white line tells me that this temperature sensor offers one measurement, uh, temperature. Now. As I mentioned earlier, we're actually going to buy two cups of coffee here so that we can do the uh, two trials at the same time, saving us a little time during our, our quick workshop here. So I'm going to turn on a second wireless temperature sensor that I have here. I'll turn it on and we should see that it can, uh, uh, appears in the list of sensors. This is 551-998. I will connect to that one as well. And you can connect to multiple sensors. One thing to note though is if you connect to a sensor, as I have connected to these two sensors, that sensor is no longer available for anyone else to connect to via Bluetooth. So you can connect multiple sensors to one computing device with SparkView, uh, but once a sensor is connected to a computing device, it's no longer available to connect to any others. That's just the way that Bluetooth works. So I now have my two temperature sensors, and you'll notice that they are both listed here in the measurements available in the center column. Uh, you just want to make sure that any measurement you're interested in is checked. Of course, I want both of these measurements. And now we can direct our attention to the upper right where you'll see templates that will allow us to choose how we'd like to visualize all of the checked measurements here. In this first activity, I'd like to choose a digits and graph display. And when I click on that, template, it will go ahead and create a Spark Lab for me that has one page that has for each of the two sensors a digits display that will show me live temperatures once we begin recording data, and a graph with two different plot areas that will show me the evolution of those measurements over time. So um, I'll see if there are any questions uh, as I set up these two cups of coffee. Uh, Kane, any, anything coming in so far? Nope. All right. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, go to the coffee shop here and have two room temperature creams. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, set up my two beakers here. It's a very scientific coffee shop. They serve in beakers and get some very hot coffee into these two beakers as we get set. Now, as I do this, you may note that uh, we're gonna have to distinguish between these two temperature sensors. And you'll notice in SparkView's displays, both the digits display and the graph display, that it's showing us the six digit ID of each sensor so that we can keep them straight. And that six digit ID shows up only when we have multiple sensors of the same measurement. So off screen here, I'm gonna get two cups of very hot coffee ready. And then we're gonna go ahead and put the temperature sensors in them and see what the difference is in the evolution of temperature over time between the two when we add cream at the coffee shop versus adding cream at school. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to put them there. A little Q&A. So you bring on the screen now these two cups of coffee. And I'm just going to mix them in the hopes that we can get very close temperatures. And I'll make sure the volumes are as close as I can get. That looks pretty. And I'm going to put the uh, sensor 551 in the left. And I'll put the sensor that starts with... 
622 on the right. And just so I can keep things a little bit straighter, I'll switch directions here so the uh, top one and the digits display here is on the left. So 662484 is on your left in the video and 551-998 is on the right. Now, one of the goals here is to try to get these coffee cups, to, uh, coffee is to start at the same temperature. And even before we begin recording data into these displays, we can take advantage of the live data bar that's in the lower left. And you'll see that the temperature on the left, 622484, is currently at 83.5 and it's beginning to decrease. And the one on the right is at 85.1, also decreasing. So I think these are within close enough range. I probably can't mix it well enough to, to get exactly the same. So they're pretty close. We're at the coffee shop. I'm going to begin recording their temperatures. And now in the digits displays and the table display, we begin to see these data points being recorded from both of these temperature sensors and visualized in these two displays. We can see in the graph, the temperature is already decreasing and they're a little temp a bit apart. Um, but what I'm going to do is we're at the coffee shop. I'm going to add cream to one of them. Let's see. I'm going to add cream to the 622 484 on the left. So we're at the coffee shop, we're adding room temperature cream. And of course we see that top plot area temperature plummet while the other one continues to decrease fairly gradually. So a few things to note, you'll notice these dots connected by lines in the graph display. Each of those dots is a data point that's being recorded uh, from each temperature sensor. And you notice that on the graphs, as these data points expand beyond the scope of the graph in either the Y or X directions, by default, the graph is changing its uh, scaling so that we can ensure that we're seeing all of the data. That scaling though is, is not fixed. It's something that we can actually manipulate very easily. So I'll show you while we continue collecting data on our commute from coffee shop to school, that if we click and drag on an axis, we can actually scale that axis, moving it as if it's a rubber sheet toward the origin or away from the origin. And that technique of clicking and dragging on the numbers works for the Y axis, as well as for the X axis. Now you'll notice as I change the X axis that these two graph areas, these plot areas as we call them are uh, linked in time. So we always have these measurements aligned. Now besides scaling by clicking and dragging on the numbers of a graph axis, you can also click in the middle of the graph and by default, it's gonna move the plot area around, up and down, right and left, so you can change your view of the data and I can get a better view of the entire run of both of those. Now it's often the case that the goal is to simply fill the graph screen with data. And for that, there is a dedicated graph tool. Each display has a little toolbar. In the case of the graph toolbar, we can open it up by pressing this little graph button if it's closed. And this shows us the tools that are available and there aren't many available as we collect data, but one of those that is available is the leftmost button. And if I hover over it, we'll see that this is called scale to fit. If I press scale to fit, those axes are automatically going to adjust and the panning will automatically adjust to make sure that we're looking at the full screen of data as full of screen as possible. Now, I would argue that this is a reasonable way to look at the data. We're uh, about two minutes in here. Um, but I think I would rather see both of these temperature measurements on the shared Y axes, because then I could see the alignment a little bit better. Now, this is a more advanced thing, something I usually don't cover, but I'm gonna show you that we could actually get rid of one of these plot areas by clicking on it and choosing this X. And that gets us with just the purple measurement. You'll notice they're distinguished here uh, in the legend, but I can return to the graph toolbar and I can add a second Y axis using this button. And this gives me an empty second Y axis on the right. So I now have Y1 showing the purple run and Y2 showing nothing yet, but there's a orange select measurement button. And if I click on that, it allows me to choose the other sensor measurement. And here I can see them overlaying on each other. Now I have to be a little bit careful because the scaling is still different. But if I press this button called keep Y axes aligned, these are now aligned. So scaling one Y axis affects the other. One more thing I'll do before we reach school and add the cream there is I'll note that I have trouble thinking in hundreds and thousands of seconds. So I'm gonna to go to the time axis. And just as we saw the select measurement button on the Y axis, there is a select measurement button on the X axis. It defaults to time, which is what we want. But if I click on it, not only can I change what measurement is being shown there, I can also change the units. So I'm gonna switch from time in seconds to time in minutes. And now we can see we've probably uh, reached school in a short three minute commute. So back on the video here, let me add the room temperature cream to the coffee that has been black on the way to school. And let's go ahead and see what happens to that temperature. Now we'll wait for those two temperatures to get fairly stable. And at that point, we'll take a look at some of the graph tools that are available that will allow us to do further things like uh, analyze the data in more detail and annotate it. But here, I think we can see that as they begin to equilibrate 
we do have probably an answer to our question without even having to do more analysis. So I'll go ahead and stop data collection. I'll press scale to fit. And now we can make a comparison there. I did have something of a gap here at the beginning between these two coffee cups, but even the warmer one, which had the cream added at school, appears to have started warmer, but actually ended up cooler. So I think that's fairly good evidence that, uh, at least in this case, the coffee got a little bit cooler when it was uh, black all the way to school, as about two thirds of you predicted. Now, if you have any thoughts on why that might be the case or where I'd wish to share uh, your thoughts there, uh, go ahead and share those in the chat. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and take this uh, time to begin to introduce some of the tools that we have in the graph toolbar that will allow us to annotate and analyze this data. One of the most useful tools here, if I were to come back a week from now and I've saved this file and reopened it, I might have forgotten what's happened. So what I'd like to do is begin by showing you how I can annotate these runs of data and particular points of data within these runs by using the annotate tool. And in the graph toolbar, that looks like the letter T. When I press annotate, it pops up in a little dialog that lets me type in a note. So I'm going to type in the note added cream. I'll press OK. And it drops a note somewhere in the middle of one of these runs. And you'll notice there are a couple parts to this note. One is the note itself, which is a little box I can move around, a text box. And it's connected by a tail to a gray box here. And I can also click and drag that gray box around and drop this wherever I'd like. And you notice it's going to snap to the nearest data point when I let go. So let me go ahead and bring it somewhere around here. And if I want to fine tune the position of the gray box, I can click these arrows. And I think that would be a reasonable point to say I added the cream. Now I can get more specific. If I want to edit this note, I can click on the note box. There's a little pencil icon and I can say added the cream at the coffee shop. So there is a way to make an annotation to point out particular phenomena that happened or causes of data change in the graph. Now I'd like to do the same for the other run and note when I added cream at school. So my first inclination is to come back to the graph toolbar and press the letter T. And let me just enter gibberish for a second here. The reason I entered gibberish is because I didn't quite get what I wanted. I just have another annotation now here on the purple run. Now, what happened? Well, this introduces the fairly uh, important topic of the active run. You'll notice I have multiple measurements um, on the graph, but I only have one graph toolbar. So SparkView needs to know or make a guess at which measurement or run, if I have multiple runs, is the one that I want to um, analyze using these tools. And the way I convey which run or measurement I want to analyze is through the graph legend, where you can see I have these Y1 and Y2 measurements, different colors with one run of data. A run is all the data you collect between hitting start and stop. Now, the reason I got this second annotation tool on the purple run is because the purple run is active, as indicated by that red box around its symbol in the legend. So let me delete this note that I don't actually want on the purple run. And I'll show you that I can make the green run active by clicking on its symbol. So the green measurement is now active. And now if I return to that single graph toolbar and choose add annotation, I can say added cream at school. And because the green measurement is active, when I press OK, this note is added to the green measurements. All right, I'll bring that over there. So annotating data is a great way to make notes about what was happening, reminders to yourself or anyone else who is viewing this. All right. So uh, that's a qualitative way to indicate what's happening. Let's get a little quantitative. Another very useful tool is called the coordinates tool. Down in the graph toolbar, it kind of looks like a crosshairs. And acknowledging that the green measurement is active, when I turn on the coordinates tool, I get something that looks a lot like the annotation tool, except it automatically shows me the X and Y coordinates of the gray box or the data point that that gray box is on. So as I nudge it left and right, you'll notice that it's changing in time and changing in temperature, telling me the coordinates of the point inside that gray box. So what I'd like to do is determine the starting temperature of this slightly hotter coffee at the coffee shop. And I can see that at time zero minutes, its temperature was uh, fairly uncomfortably hot, 84.4 degrees Celsius. Now, if I want to figure out what the change in temperature was, it would be natural to come down and add a second coordinates tool to the green measurement. And I can drop that one at the end of the data set here. And I can see that at the end of the run at 4.3 minutes, uh, the temperature dropped to 57.7. Now, if I was interested in what the change in temperature was, which is something we often do across the sciences, change in CO2 concentration, change in force, change in position, um, 
I could f do the math myself, 84.4 minus 57.7, but I'm not so good at that. And we have to do it so much that SparkView actually has a, a tool. It's a somewhat hidden tool, but I'm gonna remove the second um, coordinates tool by clicking on its text box and choosing the blue X, because I know there is a hidden feature inside the existing coordinates tool up here. If I click on its box, you'll notice that it actually has a hidden feature here. And this is the Greek letter delta, as in change. So if you have a coordinates tool and you click on it, you can choose to have the delta tool sub feature turn on. The delta tool gives you a second handle that you can now drag out to another data point in that same measurement. And what I love about the delta tool is as the name implies, it gives us the delta or change between the original gray box and the delta tool gray box. So I can see that after a change of 4.333 minutes, the temperature change in Y uh, was negative 26.8. Of course, I can use the same tool on the other one. So I'm going to go ahead and make Y1 the active run. And I'll show you a trick here. I don't actually have to turn on the coordinates tool from the toolbar. If I click a point directly, there's a little pop-up menu here in context menu. And one of those features is the coordinates tool. So instead of starting with the coordinates tool in the toolbar, you can actually just click on a data point and add the coordinates tool directly. I like that because it starts in the right place. So I'm going to turn on the Delta tool for this purple measurements coordinates tool. And I can see that the purple measurement, that is the one that had the cream added initially, had a temperature change slightly smaller. It dropped 24.6 degrees Celsius. So not a huge change, but I think it was detectable change. And this is fairly consistent with what I see. And of course, we could do other experiments. Uh, let me pause for a moment here, see if you have any questions, and uh, ask you to think about further explorations you'd like to make, thoughts you have, questions, explanations for why the temperature uh, of the black coffee as you commuted uh, cooled faster than that of the coffee with cream. If you have any thoughts like that, please do share them uh, in the chat, or if you have questions, share them in the Q&A, and we'll see what your thoughts are. Do you have an explanation for why we discovered what about two thirds of you predicted that the coffee that was black as you went to the uh, from the coffee shop to school cooled faster. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these coordinate tools so we can see the data a little bit more as we begin to address any questions or thoughts that you have here in chat. one thing that I think I see is that notice, let's see, does the graph reveal anything about the different behaviors as we were driving from school to work, from, from coffee shop rather to school? Well, let me see. Looks like there might be a difference in steepness here. I'm going to go ahead and try to ask the question and answer it with another tool. Um, how fast was the typical cooling rate for this cup of coffee versus this one in this center time here when we'd left the coffee shop and before we'd arrived at school? So let me see, I have the purple measurement active. That means if I go to the graph tools, I can turn on a tool that will allow me to analyze a rate of change through the form of a linear fit. So with the purple measurement active, I'll turn on the linear fit tool. And this does its best to do a best linear regression to the purple measurements entire run. Well, that's not quite what I want. Um, it is trying to fit the data here, here, and here. What I actually want is to analyze what's a representative slope during this one minute to three and a half minute time period. So this brings up a, a very important distinction here. We already discovered that my cursor by default is a mover of the graph. It pans it around. I can change the behavior of my cursor, though, by going to this second button, which is actually a toggle. And if I hover over it, the um, tooltip tells me this is a toggle between move mode, which is on by default, and select mode, which is what I'm looking for. So with select mode on, I can now go in the, gra in the graph. And if I click and drag, I no longer move the graph, but instead I draw a selection box. And notice what happens as that selection box begins to surround or include some data points from the purple measurement. Notice the linear fit is updating so that it is now analyzing only those data points that are inside the box highlighted in yellow. And I can adjust the size of the box, the location of the box after the fact, and that linear fit will always update to reflect that. So what have I discovered? Well, 
it looks like the slope here, that's fairly linear, probably not precisely linear, but a representative slope is about negative 0.937, so about almost negative one degree Celsius per minute, since my y-axis unit is degree Celsius and the x-axis unit is minute. So let me switch and make the green measurement active. I'm gonna do the same thing, make sure my select mode is on. Now I could start with the linear fit or I can flip things again. I could start with the selection. I'll draw that selection box. And just as we saw with that coordinates tool, it pops open some tools that I could use, including a linear fit. And here I can see that indeed the cooling rate for the coffee that was black in the car versus the one that had cream added already was a little over two and a half times greater. So it seems that it was cooling faster than the, the black coffee was cooling faster than the uh, coffee that had cream added at the coffee shop already. I'll leave it to you to share some thoughts about why that might be in the chat. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up with one final goal, and that is a goal of preserving what we've discovered here. So let's talk about some of the ways we can save and share information from SparkView. For each of the three activities today, we're gonna to look at one new way that we can save things and share things. The first is the most comprehensive and what I always do, and that is we could save the entire SparkLab experiment in a format that allows anyone in SparkView to open that and see what we've done. So preserve everything about it from the data to the displays to even the analysis that we've performed. Well, how do you save a SparkLab? Well, on most platforms, you can go to the main menu and this main menu opens up some options, including save. So I'm gonna save this SparkLab file. And at this moment, this is the first time that you can tell I'm actually on a Windows computer. Um, one of our goals in SparkView is to make it available on all the platforms that are used in schools, but also to make it behave the same across all those platforms. Now, we can't make it behave the same when we're saving files, it has to use the OS. So this is the Windows save dialog, but it works the same on other platforms. Let me go ahead and save this file as uh, coffee cooling data. And it's going to save with the extension .spklab. So you do need SparkView to open this file, but you can open it on any computing device that has SparkView. I will save it to my desktop. And now, knowing that I've saved it, I could actually close the SparkView program. And if I head to my desktop, here is the file. I could double click that. Or if I wanted to, I could relaunch SparkView. And from the welcome screen, instead of choosing sensor data, I could choose to open a saved experiment. And there's my file, open it up, and we'll see everything has been preserved about it from displays to data to the data analysis. All right, thanks for sharing your thoughts on why the black coffee was cooling faster in the chat. There. All right, so we've seen how to connect sensors to, so a fairly sophisticated first experiment here. We've also seen how, that we, how we can um, uh, change the displays that we're looking at, selecting those after we've uh, chosen the sensors and we've collected a measurement from each sensor and done some pretty sophisticated analysis from annotating it to analyzing data points and change between data points with the delta and coordinates tools and doing linear fits to each of these. So let us uh, make one quick note. Um, if you're on a mobile device like an Android or iPhone, um, you will see that there's actually a button dedicated to sharing that uses the operating system's uh, share button, uh, sharing features rather, share sheets. Um, that's one of the few places that we have a difference between SparkView on different platforms. That's when we're opening and saving files. So we've looked at the sensor data path. We've also opened a saved experiment. And here's a quick rundown of the things that we've learned in this first activity. I'll pause here. You can take a look at it. Um, and let's look if there are any questions or comments in chat. All right. Marie speculates the coffee at the coffee shop was hotter and the milk is the same temperature. So overall it stayed warmer. Uh, Asnasia, the green one cooled faster because its temperature dropped on the way to school, adding cream made it cool faster than the first. All right. Cool. So maybe a tip on uh, how you can keep your coffee hotter if it gets too cool or cooler if it's too hot. All right, so a little bit more about SparkView software we begin before we jump into the next activity. Um, as I mentioned, the goal of SparkView is to be available on all the platforms that are used in education these days, and even more importantly, to act pretty much the same on all those platforms. So SparkView is available on Windows, Mac OS computers, Chromebooks, uh, for iPhones, iPads, Android phones and tablets, and also on our dedicated Spark data loggers. And SparkView is available in two different forms. The good news is these two forms behave pretty much the same. I will be showing you both forms today. The first is the dedicated SparkView application. 
How do you get the Spark for your application? Well, it depends on the platform you're on. If you're on a Windows or Mac computer, it's available as a site license that can be purchased if you or your IT folks want to install it locally on your Windows and Macintosh computers. Um, on iOS, iPads, Android, it's available as a free app uh, from the respective app stores. Now, the story with Chrome OS, that is Chromebooks, is changing. Um, it is available on the Chrome Web Store and has been for many years, but things are changing. Uh, if you are running the latest version of Chrome OS 127, uh, they've made some changes that have some Bluetooth issues, and the whole Chrome Web Store is slated to be removed by Google in January of 2025, so just a few months from now. So this next solution I'll talk about in a moment is the solution for Chromebook users and for some others. So dedicated SparkView application available uh, as a paid installer or as a free app, depending on your platform. There is a relatively new way to do SparkView though, and it's pretty clever. It works inside a browser, and this is called a progressive web app or PWA. And the progressive web app works on Windows, Mac OS, Chrome OS. It is free. And all you need to do is go to a website with a compatible browser on those three platforms. On Windows and Mac, it works in the Chrome browser and the Edge browser. And on Chrome OS, it works on Chrome since there is no Edge browser. And all you need to do is go to sparkview.pasco.com. And in a moment after a download to your browser, no permissions needed there, um, you'll be running SparkView in a form that behaves pretty much the same as the dedicated application. So in the next activity, we'll be taking a look at how this PWA works. There's only one crucial difference in how the PWA works, and we'll see that in a moment. If you want any more information about SparkView on any of these platforms, uh, you can go to pasco.com slash SparkView. All right. So um, if you want to learn more about SparkView, we kind of did a quick run through. You have the recording to review, um, but there is a whole resource available within SparkView's main menu um, or directly via the web if you go to help.pasco.com slash SparkView. And for example, if you search for graph display, you'll see a rundown of the tools we covered and some additional tools we didn't cover, but I'll assure you that the tools we did cover are pretty core to um, the uh, different types of tools from selecting data points uh, for analyses like coordinates to selecting ranges of data points for things like curve fits and the statistics. So um, we're going to jump to the next activity now. And for this one, we're going to do an investigation where we try to answer a question about a very fast phenomenon. And this fast phenomenon is the collision of a cart with a barrier. So let me give you a view of this. I have a track on a small incline and I have a smart cart. And the question we're going to try to address here is how can we accurately capture the force during a brief impact of this cart, smart cart, against the end stop there or wall. And I'll just illustrate what we're going to uh, do. I'm just going to release the cart from a fixed point up the ramp. It has a spring on the end of it and that spring uh, collides with the end stop there and it bounces back. And the question at hand is, how can we actually ca act accurately rather capture the force during that brief impact? So uh, as promised, I'm going to use the SparkView PWA. So instead of launching the SparkView application that I happen to have installed on this computer, I will go ahead and close SparkView knowing that I've saved this file. And instead I'm going to launch the Chrome browser and see what I was doing earlier here. So let me just go to uh, Google here to show you that we're clearing things out. And all I need to do is open a compatible browser, that is Google or Edge, and go to sparkview.pasco.com. It's going to download into the browser anything it needs. And I am now inside a browser, but I am running SparkView inside that browser, and it is the SparkView Progressive Web App, or PWA. Now, almost everything from now on is going to behave exactly the same, whether you're on the PWA or the native application. There's only one difference, and that is something that we can't control, and that is how to connect a Bluetooth device to the browser running SparkView instead of connecting it directly to SparkView. So the one thing we're going to look at that's different in this path of the PWA is how to connect Bluetooth sensors. So once again, I'm going to choose the sensor data path. The screen looks the same, but subtly different is the direction here. I need to click on the Bluetooth icon up here to open up my browser's Bluetooth dialog. And at this point, I'm going to connect to my sensor. It still shows me the six-digit ID of this sensor, even though this isn't a white sensor. It is a wireless sensor that has a six-digit ID. I'll go ahead and pair it to the browser, and that will give access to this smart carts measurement to the SparkView Progressive Web App that's running within the browser. When it is connected, there we see it. 
We can see that the smart cart is actually a suite of sensors on low friction wheels. It includes a sensor that measures the position, velocity, and acceleration of the cart through an optical encoder from the wheel spinning. Um, there is a force sensor. That's what I've connected the spring attachment to, so we can measure the force uh, the spring is exerting on the cart. There is an acceleration sensor built in for three axes of acceleration. Indeed, it also measures the rotational velocity or angular velocity uh, at that same location. What I'm really interested in fo is in force for now. So I'm going to turn off the check mark for position and turn on the check mark for force. And now I'm going to come over to the, say, table and graph display so that I can see a table of time and force and a graph of force versus time. And we're going to be in by asking the question, if I just record some data right now, am I going to get the data that we want that accurately describes the collision? So I'll put the cart at a known spot here, and I'm going to press start. We'll go ahead and begin recording data, and I'll release the cart and catch it on the way back up. I'll press stop, and we can see in the table and graph the data points that were recorded. I'll go ahead and stretch out the x-axis of the graph. And my question to you is, have we captured an accurate representation of the forces exerted on this cart during the collision. So if you have any thoughts about things we could improve, go ahead and share those in the chat. And again, we're looking here at a graph of force versus time and the corresponding data points in a table. One of the things I can immediately see from the table that's reflected in the graph as well is there appears to be only one data point that's actually any significant force away from zero newtons. Here it's about negative 9.68. I'm beginning to be a little suspicious if it's just one data point. Um, am I accurately capturing what was happening during that whole collision? Uh, if I use the uh, delta tool, I can see that that collision definitely lasted only a short time. Uh, less than 0.1 seconds, less than a tenth of a second. And I can see that these data points are plot, hair, 1.4, 1.45. So these data points are just 0 0.05 seconds apart, yet I only captured one force that seems to capture the measurement of the force when it's colliding. Uh, Vicky says, uh, is the full spring hitting the wall at the same time? Yeah, so the, the end of the spring here, is uh, hitting the end stop there, effectively the wall, and it's transmitting that force into the force sensor to which it's attached in the cart. Uh, Marie suggests increasing the frequency. Yeah, so I'm recording data every 0 0.05, 0 0.05 seconds uh, from the force sensor, and it feels to me like during this short time period I need to collect more data points. So one of the main things I want to show you is how do we increase the frequency of data collection, what we call the sample rate. Um, David's asking about, uh, sorry, Philip's asking about increasing the graph size. I think all I can do is uh, make the browser full screen there. That allows me to change it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so we're still in the browser, but I've just made it full screen, so hiding the browser controls. So let's look at first at changing the frequency of data collection. Now, I can go over here to this little dial in the lower bar that says periodic 20 hertz, and it happens 20 hertz is 20 samples per second, and that's why I'm getting a data point for the force sensor every 0 0.05 seconds that corresponds to 20 measurements per second. But if I open up the dial here, I can go in and I can change that sample rate. I can make it slower if I was doing an experiment like a weather sensor make, measuring the weather once uh, every 10 minutes outside. In this case, though, I want to go much faster, so let's go all the way to the right here and I can see that I can try to get 500 hertz or 500 samples per second from this smart cart. So let's see, at 500 hertz, if I press start, I want to record a run here that, hmm, I didn't even get to drop the sense the uh, cart there because I got a message that said the system can't keep up with the sample rate. So I'm trying to sample at 500 hertz or 500 recordings per second from all 11 measurements, position, velocity, acceleration, force, etc. So uh, how can I fix this? Well, I don't want to sample more slowly, but I can play this trick where I don't actually need all the measurements. Even though I'm only looking at force, Sparkview is trying to record the measurements from all of those 11 sensors on the cart. So I'm going to go into this little setup screen here, and I'm going to say, you know what? Um, I definitely don't want acceleration sensor measurements. I don't want the gyro sensor. I could turn off position sensor measurements, but it turns out that may be of interest. So let me just turn off the measurements for the acceleration and gyro sensors, and let me try this again. And, um, by the way, you may be noticing other subtle things. Um, you may notice that that initial force is not actually quite zero. It's about, what, 0.1 newtons. 
So one other thing I can do to improve this, besides the very crucial thing of increasing the sample rate, is I could come in here and put the cart in the orientation I want to measure zero newtons. And I can come to the what's the live data bar. And the live data bar is actually also a button. So if I click on the live data bar, I can choose to zero the sensor now. And that's going to define the current force measurement as something close to zero. So having zeroed and more importantly, having uh, changed the sample rate and turned off measurements, I can actually come in here and increase the sample rate for the force sensor even higher. And I can have different sample rates between the sensors. I think that should work fine. So I'm going to press start once again, release that. And now if I scale my x-axis, we should be able to see that I measured multiple data points during that collision. So previously I was probably just picking off one of these measurements at a slow sample rate. I'm now measuring many data points during that collision. I have more faith that this is a good representation of the forces during that collision. Uh, you can see I collected 3,859 data points for each of those measurements. Now um, that's one thing we can do, changing the sample rate, turning off unnecessary measurements for multiple measure sensors uh, to make sure that we're collecting the data of interest. Now, we're not going to dive into this too deeply, but a couple of things we could do here. One is um, I've collected some data that I'm not interested in. So run number one and two have been hidden. I can go ahead and make them visible again if I want uh, by turning on their visibility checkboxes, but I don't actually want them. If I want to get rid of them completely, I can come to this experiment tools button and I can choose to manage runs. And I could choose to delete run one completely. It asks me to confirm because this is permanent. And I can do the same for run number two. So I'm left only with run number three. Um, and if you do an engineering design challenge, you may be interested in maybe creating a barrier that reduces the uh, magnitude of the maximum force here, which was coordinates tool about 20 newtons. Why was it negative? Well, that's just the direction, the sign convention of the sensor. And I could change that in that same live data bar. Another thing you may be interested in doing if you teach physics is looking at the area, quote, under this curve, uh, which we know is impulse. And there's a tool that will let us do that. It's called the statistics tool. Now, the statistics tool offers min, max, mean, but it also offers area. And if I turn on area, you'll see it shading all the area between the data points and the y equals zero axis. Now, if I want to constrain this to just the collision, we can use that same technique of switching from move mode to select mode. And there I can look at the calculation of the area between the curve and the y equals zero axis, which I can see is uh, negative 0.50, that would be Newton seconds. And uh, if you teach physics, you may want to make an association between that area under the curve and how the motion of the cart changed, uh, which we can do by quickly adding another y, uh, another uh, plot area rather, and looking at say the velocity and beginning to ask questions like, what's the relationship between the impulse, the force over time on that cart, and things like the change in velocity of that cart. So if I make the lower plot areas measurement active, I could turn on a delta tool and see what the change in velocity was. And you could probably take the information on screen now and figure out what the mass of that smart cart is. All right, so um, changing the sample rate, turning off unnecessary measurements, some crucial things if you're doing experiments that are very slow or very fast. Okay, any questions going into that? No? All right. Um, so let me continue on and show you another way to share data from SparkView. And that is uh, one I don't use so often, but it's sometimes requested. And that is we could export the data from SparkView, and this is just the sensor data, none of the displays, none of the analysis, into a format that can be opened in any spreadsheet or data analysis package. So to do that, we're going to return to the main menu and choose Export Data. And if I choose export data, it allows me to export it in what's called a CSV file. CSV stands for comma separated value. So I'm going to say this is uh, exported data cart collision. I'll save that to my desktop. Uh, just for good measure, let me also save this as a SparkLab file. By the way, notice it's saving, even though it's in the browser, it's saving just as it would from SparkView. If I go to my desktop, my computer associates CSV files with Excel. So I could simply click on that and it gives me just the raw data from the sensor. That is, for that run that I had, all the times, forces, positions, and so forth. So all the measurements that were on and all the data points. Now, what I don't have is any displays or analysis, but of course, if I wanted to, I could create those in a different data analysis package. So it's not used so often, but if you ever want to get sensor data out of SparkView to use in another application, you can export it as a CSV file. 
All right. So we looked at changing sample rates, whether it's a common sample rate between multiple measurements or selecting a mixed sample rate where it varies by sensor. I've turned off some measurements. By the way, I turned it off in the hardware setup screen, but you can also turn it off if you know ahead of time in the sensor data configuration screen by turning off those sensors you don't need. And we also looked at zeroing measurements, which we can access from the uh, live data bar. By the way, there's also a button for zeroing all measurements on the um, lower bar, but that zeroes absolutely everything, so it doesn't give you fine control over which is being zeroed. All right, so here's a quick overview of what we've just covered here in the second activity. Let's see if there are any further questions to address. Doesn't look like it. All right, keep the questions coming if you have them. We are going to talk briefly about the sensors available for use with SparkView, and the good news is if it's a PASCO sensor created in the past 30 years, it works with SparkView. Um, so we have our latest line of sensors, the white wireless sensors, like this pressure sensor, the temperature sensor, and even the smart cart in blue or red. Um, these connect via Bluetooth low energy, that's Bluetooth 4 or 5. And the advantage of Bluetooth low energy, it is, allows us to connect the same across platforms. Notice I didn't need to go into any operating system settings because Bluetooth low energy lets us connect, whether we're in the PWA app or the SparkView app, inside the app itself. But SparkView also supports our passport sensors, which started in 2001. By the way, I'm showing you pictures here of our motion sensor. You can see how it's evolved uh, backwards in time here from left to right. Um, passport sensors are also supported in SparkView. And even our science workshop sensors, which are generally black um, from the late 1990s and onward, also work. So we uh, strive to support all of our sensors in SparkView and have done so with these three families of sensors. So you, have sensor, you may have sensors that are older than your uh, typical student, maybe even older than you. Um, that are still compatible with SparkView with the proper interface. By the way, the wireless sensors can connect directly to SparkView, but with the Passport Blue sensors and Science Workshop Black sensors, you'll need an interface box to connect to the computer. You can learn more about these sensors and interfaces available for Passport and Science Workshop uh, by going to pasco.com slash sensors. Let us know if you have any questions in the chat. So um, we have a few minutes left, and thankfully this final activity takes only a few minutes. Thanks, Kane, for pasting that link in the chat. Um, and in this final activity, we are going to investigate um, the relationship between gas pressure and volume. We're going to try to discover that relationship between gas pressure and volume. And we're going to do so using a wireless pressure sensor and an accessory that comes with the sensor. Um, this accessory is just a syringe. The main question here, though, is um, if we have a sensor that measures pressure and we have a syringe that can show us the volume, how can we associate the volumes with the pressures? So let me show you a view of my tabletop here. All right, and I have the wireless pressure sensor. We're gonna connect that as we do with every uh, wireless sensor. Um, that's gonna give us the pressure, but if our goal is to find the relationship between gas pressure measured from the sensor and volume, we need some way to determine the volume. Well, handily, the sensor comes with this syringe that's marked in milliliters. Um, I'm going to connect the syringe to the pressure sensor, so I've sealed a certain amount of uh, air in there. Um, and we'll notice that I could read the volumes off of here, but the question becomes, how do I associate these volumes with the pressure measurements from the sensor? And the answer is we're going to use a new technique called manual sampling. So I'm going to relaunch SparkView. Again, it doesn't matter if I'm using the PWA or the installed app. I'm going to use the installed app this time. And instead of choosing the sensor data path, which would work, I'm going to take more control by building my own experiment and taking control over which displays I'm going to use for this investigation. And I'll do that by choosing the build new experiment path. When I choose build new experiment, it allows me to choose a template, basically a page layout. And I'm going to choose a layout, in this case, the third one down that has a small thing on the left of the screen and a large thing on the right. And as soon as I do that, it builds the page, it opens a Spark Lab, and it allows me to choose what displays I'd like in each of these layout spaces. So these are basically placeholders, and I'd like a table because I want to type some volumes in. I'm going to be the enterer of that data, and I'd like to see a graph of what's in the table. So I've constructed these two displays and a layout configuration that I've chosen via the build path, um, but I now need to define what measurements I need in each of these displays. Now, one thing to know is that when you are inside a Spark Lab already, um, you can't go back to the sensor data path to connect the sensor. So we're just going to go directly to the Bluetooth button, whether we're in the PWA or the native SparkView app. And I'm going to connect my pressure sensor as we normally would. And now I have available for any of these little select measurement buttons, the pressure sensor. So I'm going to put the pressure measurement on the second column of the table and on the Y axis of the graph. Now the X axis defaults to time. I'm not really interested in time. 
what I'm interested in is how the pressure varies with volume. So the volume is something I'm going to have to type in. It's called user entered data. And the quickest way to begin is just by typing in an empty column in the, the graph, in the table rather. So I know I'm going to do about every five milliliters. I should have time for that. So I'm going to type in all of the volumes. I could change these afterwards. I could add these live. Uh, but since I'm only doing this single-handedly, I'm going to type in what I know to be a range of volumes that I can do single-handedly. Um, and now I can change the x-axis from time to the thing I really want there, which is, well, right now it's called the user data, but I can press this pencil and change it to something that's more descriptive, like volume. And since the syringe is in milliliters, I will choose milliliters as well. And I'll change the x-axis to that. Now, a little dilemma here, I don't see my volume measurement available. That's because there are two tabs of measurements. One is coming from sensors, and the other is user entered, and it's on the user entered tab that I'll see my volume. So I think I'm mostly set up here, but let me show you one final dilemma we need to solve. That is, if I press start and I'm ready to collect a volume at six, ah, uh, hmm. Well, what just happened? Well, I press start and it began recording data. How fast? Well, it began recording data at the sample rate, which is 20 hertz. That's 0 0.05 seconds between samples. That's not enough time for me to change the volumes and make sure I'm at the right volume. So what happened here is it defaulted to periodic mode, that is, recording data at the sensor sample rate. I'm going to delete this run from the experiment data menu, as we saw in the previous activity. What I really need to do is take control over when these measurements are recorded from the sensor. And I can do that by returning to our sampling options dialog and switching from periodic mode, where the recording rate's dictated by the sample rate, to manual mode, where it is dictated by me, as you'll see in a moment. And now I can take my time, because when I press start, it shows me what the current pressure is, but it doesn't record it until I manually command it to record it using the screen check mark or equivalently this one down here. So let me go to the first volume, which I can see from line one is 60 milliliters. I'll do this fairly rapidly, but as soon as I press the check mark, notice that that pressure is kept associated with this volume in the first row of the table. I'll go down to 55. And since we're in a bit of a rush, I'll just keep keeping the green button's called keep, down to 45, 40. And you can see this data being plotted live on the graph to the right. That's 35, getting easier now, back to 30, which is where I started. And now I'm going to begin to press the syringe plunger in to get to 25. Keep 20, it's getting tougher to push it in. And with one hand, that's about as far as I can go, keep. And I have all the data points here from 60 down to 15. Now, it can puzzle students, why do I have an extra data point here? Notice it's in color. It's not actually yet recorded. It's what would be recorded next if I continued keeping data points. But since I've reached the last volume I'm interested in, I will simply press stop. And I now have my graph of the relationship between the measured pressures from the sensor and the corresponding volumes that were typed in by me as user entered data. I'm going to turn off the connecting lines here so we don't get confused. I've gone into the settings for the graph. And here are the data points. And the final question becomes, so what is this relationship between the y-axis measurement pressure and the x-axis measurement volume? Well, when we begin talking about graphical analysis of relationships, we start to think about curve fits. We've already learned that there's a linear fit available in the graph toolbar. That doesn't look like it works very well, though. But Never fear, there's actually a button full of other curve fits that aren't linear, and it repeats linear just for good measure. If I press the full curve fit button, I can choose from a range of curve fits, relationships that we find across the sciences. And I might say, well, hmm, inverse square, how's that? Uh, definitely better than linear. It doesn't look great. There's some trends it doesn't seem to be matching. But what I can do is look at the root mean squared error here. And the word error tells me the lower the error, the better it is. So I'm going to compare this, about 8 root mean squared error, with another fit. Let's try the inverse, similar shape. Ah, here the root mean squared error is under one. So it looks like visually and from the root mean squared error that I've discovered fairly convincingly a linear, an inverse relationship rather between the y-axis measurement pressure and the x-axis measurement volume. All right, so that's a quick investigation using manual sampling. And I'm gonna show you one final way to share information from SparkView before we close, and that is Oftentimes, our students are writing a report, and they just need an image of what they discovered. And a quick way to make an image is to 
take a screenshot on, on platforms like Windows, Mac, and Chrome. And once again, uh, if you're on a phone or a tablet, that sharing button will allow you to take a, an image of the display. But I'm on a Windows computer, so I'm going to remember this keyboard shortcut, Windows Shift S, return to Spark View and press those keys, Windows Shift and S. And I can quickly grab a screenshot of just the part of the Spark View screen I want, the graph. And now I could come over to a report. Let's say I'm submitting my results here, and I can go ahead and edit paste this into my report. And I now have a static image, as it is just a static image. That's good to keep in mind. I probably want to save the Spark View file if I want to get back to it. But that's a quick way to get the information, the image of your results out of Spark View and into a report. All right. So final path we chose there is the build path, giving you control over the configuration of displays and what is populating those displays. And here's what we learned. Main point here is this manual sampling technique after we built our own pages. So uh, I'm going to wrap up by giving you a few thoughts about where you can get or make experiments for SparkView. Uh, you can create your own. We saw that we can build experiments as we did with this gas pressure versus volume, or you can choose the sensor data path if you know the uh, templates that SparkView offers on that path are sufficient for your needs as they were for our first two activities. Um, there are labs included with SparkView. I didn't do this, but let me head back to SparkView and start again because I didn't actually need to build that new experiment. I wanted to do that to show you that approach, but it turns out that this is a very popular lab. And if I went into the sensor data path with the pressure sensor connected, it has some built-in labs. And one of those is, hey, Boyle's Law. And if I do that, it is configured much like I did manually. But I want to show you the manual technique because that works with any sensors. This is only available with the wireless pressure sensor for Boyle's Law. So included with SparkView are quick start experiments and experiments for our curriculum like essential physics and chemistry. And finally, we have uh, an extensive experiment library that's free online, over a thousand labs, and you can get to it at pasco.com slash free labs. And there you'll find many versions of Boyle's Law that include handouts that you can give to students. Sometimes they point you to configuration files built into SparkView, sometimes provide instructions for creating them yourself. But source of experiments, you can create your own, students can create their own, some are included in SparkView, and many hundreds are available for free at pasco.com slash free labs. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, if you have further questions, we encourage you to contact your regional PASCO rep. You can go to pasco.com slash support um, to find your rep uh, both in the U.S. and across the world. And with that, we'll formally wrap it up.